Hey guys, this is Ryan Feldman uh, from the Poison Lab or EM Poison Farm D on Twitter. Um, and I wanted to make a video today because I just realized something incredible. Uh, I, about three years ago, made a digital a virtual shock video game with a fully functioning cardiovascular system that has a preload afterload cardiac output and it can be modified by fully functional digital vasopressors which have varying beta alpha ratios all these things so it's a virtual environment for you to resuscitate a bunch of critically ill patients and what you're seeing on my head here is a virtual reality headset and i didn't realize it until today I can actually play this game in virtual reality. You can play it on your phone and you can play it on the computer, but I didn't realize I could play it in virtual reality. So I wanted to make this video real quick. We're going to go through and actually resuscitate um, a patient uh, to figure out what kind of shock they have, use pressors, fluids, whatever we need to, nitro, whatever, to get them to where they need to be. So I'm going to take you through on that video now. Uh, for all those who recently saw me at mid-year, yeah, I do now have a fresh January stash. Of course, I decided to make a video with my actual face with the mustache, but hey, here we go. Let's dive in. All right. So here we are in our virtual world. Pretty nice, huh? So we're going to be going through actually resuscitating a patient in this virtual environment. Uh, this video is going to be, uh, in terms of baseline knowledge level, if you need to still learn what the different types of shocks are and how the different vasopressors Oh man, I really wish my lips moved. If you need to learn what the different types of shocks are and how the different vasopressors affect the body, meaning where the alpha-1 receptors are, where the beta-2 receptors are, where the beta-1 receptors are, that's going to be this video, okay? And then if you need to learn how to actually play the game itself, I'm going to release, I think, more of a side tutorial. This will go through a lot of the features of the game. Um, but it's going to be a little bit faster. I will also release a side tutorial where you could see things a little bit easier uh, on a full computer screen. But right now, let's go ahead and uh, resuscitate some patients. So let's dive into the game. First thing we're going to do is open up Firefox Reality. But you can open this up on any browser. Now... The easiest way to get to this game is to go to www.thepoisonlab.com. This is actually the website for my toxicology podcast, which some of you may have listened to, but it's the quickest way to get there without entering in a large amount of numbers and letters. Then I want you to go to Medical Games and Resources right there. And then we're going to go to Toxo's Resuscitation Game where we'll manage virtual shock patients and learn all about the drugs we use to keep the sickest patients alive. Let's go ahead. And then here, this is the actual site. It's rfeldman.itch.io, but that's complicated. You could see some fun stuff about uh, how to play here, but we're just going to run the game. All right. So we're at Our Lady of Pixel Hospital. And this, <laughs> this is so cool. I am literally in this environment. This is awesome. So the hospital is run by the Poison Lab. Got to put in a free plug for the podcast there. Here we have many critically ill patients. Do you think you can help us keep them alive? If you're new here, check out training and resources. So this is a little bit of a tutorial for you guys. Way at the bottom, you can find a review of all the different shock types as well as their vasopressors. So you can find all of these things here. Uh, the different ways preload afterload cardiac output are affected in the different shock phenotypes if you want to read through it here there's stuff about management of cardiogenic shock you could find say hey how do i actually manage for the aha guidelines cardiogenic shock but let's go ahead and actually just treat a patient you can get into all that stuff later uh, the other thing in here is we have an ACLS practice area where you'll see what this looks like, but you can come in here and run mini codes, which is kind of fun too. All right, but we're going to go in, enter in the hospital. We're going to say we are actually VR awesome. All right, your least favorite social worker. Wow, all right. It's easy to walk in. Dr. VR awesome, I am so glad you're here. I have a feeling today is going to be a nightmare. There are actually five patients waiting for you. Let's get moving. I think, why don't we go ahead and go to bed one. 
You enter and see a woman of advanced stage who appears lethargic and tachypnic. She does not respond to you when you ask her name. For the family, she's normally alert and oriented times four. She's had shortness of breath, cough, and a fever for three days. Bummer. You can click on things to see what they will reveal. So past medical history, she's 100 kilos, 166 centimeters, depression and hypothyroidism. Take sertraline and levothyroxine. Vitals, heart rate 122, MAP of 21, yikes, respiratory rate 21, pulse ox 87% on 10 liters of oxygen. She's got a T of 103. Clicking physical exam, lung sounds, ronchi and crackles. The skin is warm, mottled and pale and she has petechiae. Labs and imaging. Okay. So all of these things are somewhat randomly generated, but they do affect the care of the patient you're going to get. So for one thing, okay, I see I have an ABG pH of 7.3, a lactic of 4, PCO2 of 29. So she's hyperventilating. She's got a metabolic acidosis, PO2 76. That's good, actually. And I have a high white count. She's tachycardic. I got surge criteria and a source of infection. So this seems like septic shock. You order antibiotics for pneumonia as well as blood and respiratory cultures. Because you're at a teaching hospital, a pulmonary artery catheter, arterial line, and central venous line are placed for educational purposes. Guess what? Every one of these shocks has this. So now we can look at all of our different parameters. I have a central venous pressure of 8. Is that normal or abnormal? Well, if you aren't familiar with bedside and basic hemodynamics, scroll all the way down to the bottom. Click for normal hemodynamic values. And this? Okay, CVP 8 to 12. So she's on the low end of normal for preload. Heart rate, stroke volume, ejection fraction, a normal cardiac output, 4 to 8. And then this, a measure of afterload systemic vascular resistance, which is measured in dynes, 700 to 1500. Let's take a look at our patient again. So I see she has a low normal preload, elevated heart rate, actually a normal cardiac output, and a low systemic vascular resistance. So I wonder what kind of shock she has. Here we can go click for vasopressor effects and hemodynamic changes in shock. These little quick references are with you on every page. Okay, so here's some pressors and how they work, but over here, I've got a low preload, a low afterload, and a high output. This seems like a distributive shock. Okay, well, what should we do? We need to get the patient's map to 65, select all desired interventions. I'm going to run through this one as normal, and then we'll go through. First thing we do in distributive shock is fluid. Okay, so I gave her a half liter of lactate and ringers. Her central venous pressure increased. And then actually her preload increase, which increased her ejection fraction. Frank Starling tells us that preload is directly proportional to stroke volume uh, unless you're in heart failure. So our cardiac output went up. That's great. I'm going to try to give her some more fluid. This is our standard. Oop, but I am at a pulse ox of 84%, so I might need to intubate her. We have pretreated her a little bit. Each time you click, you could click on any one of these and do a whole bunch of things, or you click on one at a time, and then you simply reassess. So we're going to give her, I'm going to try to get her just a little bit better before intubation. Okay, preload went up again. My stroke volume went up again. Heart rate actually went down, because we know that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. As my stroke volume is increasing, I'm actually decreasing heart rate, because I don't need to compensate so much. So that's great. My MAP is going up as well. Oh, boy, she's really decompensating. We better intubate. Okay, patient is intubated. Ooh, and here we see my central venous pressure actually dropped down to 6. In truth, if you measured the central venous pressure here, it would measure higher. But effectively, what intubation does with positive pressure is reduce venous return to the heart and thus reduces my ejection fraction, reduces my cardiac output, and reduces my MAP. So intubation can cause some problems. Luckily, we resuscitated her a little bit beforehand, and she didn't collapse from it. So let's go ahead and give her some more fluid. And we'll reassess. Looking good. CVP's on its way up. She's 100 kilos. You could argue she needs 3 liters of fluid, 30 mil per kilo, before we really do much else, although that afterload is just awful. So I'm going to start working on it. Oh, man. She really is going to need some food. Um, she's pretty refractory. I don't want to give her too much. Maybe albumin? Oh, wait a minute. Per the surviving sepsis guidelines, they recommend that you actually 
wait until you have fluid refractory sepsis before reaching for colloid, even though the subgroup analysis of the SAFE trial was pretty promising. So we'll stick to fluid for right now. Because she's so ill, and I'm going to have to start post-intubation sedation, I'm going to throw norepinephrine on. And let's just do that real quick. So norepinephrine was started. I see my afterload has increased for the first time. Okay. And then heart rate has actually gone up a little bit. Stroke volume EF with my fluids. Now let's go ahead and start my post-intubation sedation. And I'm going to go ahead and increase my norepi. I might even give us some more fluid. Now you could be saying to me, Ryan, you're giving so much fluid, but we're actually measuring her preload. And I know she's at a normal range of her preload, so she seems appropriate. If you are treating somebody in septic shock, you're going to do multiple assessments of their preload status. You're going to look at uh, leg lift challenge. You're going to look at IVC um, collapsibility. But if you can measure your preload, this is also helpful. All right, MAP is on its way up. I started propofol and fentanyl, and my systemic vascular resistance has decreased a little bit because we know sedation reduces catecholamine release. But let's keep it going. I'm going to increase my norepi dose, and I'm going to get more fluid. Screw it. This is the place to do it. We'll do some hydrocortisone too. All right. So norepi's on. My afterload is up. My MAP is on its way up. Let's go ahead and add vasopressin because I know she's pretty refractory. Increase my norepi. I mean, I have um, dynes of 374. When I go here, my normal hemodynamic values are going to increase. I, I, I'm less than halfway to a normal SVR. So I'm going to add some more afterload squeezing effects. Okay. Uh-oh. So I increased my norepi. What happened? Dines went up. I added vasopressin. Dines went up. I actually increased my cardiac output a little bit. Remember, norepi does have some beta effect and can potentially also, it can increase or decrease your heart rate. Okay. And remember that beta effect can lead to ectopy. So now I've got a patient who's got premature ventricular contractions. That's certainly concerning. I'm going to try to reduce the amount of beta that I need. I already have vasopressin on, which is great. Little tip. All of the vasopressors have an evidence-based odds ratio for randomly generating VTAC. So the more beta that you're giving and the worse presser, the more likely your patient is to die. Okay, so I gave her some phenylephrine because this is pure alpha. I see my afterload went up. My cardiac output actually went down a little bit because the patient is now squeezing against an increased afterload. And we know stroke volume is somewhat inversely proportional to afterload. All right. Let's do it again. Oh boy. All right. Dines are up. We're getting really close. She's adequately fluid resuscitated. My map is, uh, my dines are getting close to a normal afterload. But this wouldn't be any fun if we didn't think make things wild. What does she not need? Any more cardiac output. She's high above normal. So let's see what happens when you add an inotrope to one of these shocks. I'm going to add dobutamine and dopamine. This might actually work. We'll see. Oh, no. Okay. We have a rhythm change. It looks like wide complex monomorphic. Oh, it did increase her heart rate, but we got to check a pulse. Okay. It looks like we have no detectable pulse. If you need help, you can check your ACLS cardiac arrest algorithm. Here it is. But I think we know what to do here. First, we'll perform CPR and get our pads ready to charge. I'm going to charge for direct current cardioversion. And you know what? I'm actually going to give one of Epi right now because in the real world, sometimes we get this stuff going. I'll prepare Amio. I'm going to shock. And we're going to resume CPR. Still no detectable femoral pulse. We've been doing CPR for two minutes now. It's about to be a pulse and rhythm check. Well, we're already doing CPR. Uh, it's time for some Amio. We're still in VT. And I'm going to charge and shock again. We went a little earlier than what they would normally recommend. Still wide complex, still no pulse. I'm on my third cycle of CPR. I look at here. I've shocked CPR, shocked. Then we did epi, and then we did amio. I was a little bit forward with this, but in real life, sometimes you just kind of give everything at once. Uh, you know what? We're due for another epi because it's every four. I'm going to charge. I'm just going to give the amio, and I'm going to pray that we get them back. Ooh, we have a pulse. 
Okay, but we're still in a wide complex tachycardia. So if you need help with this, ACLS tachycardia with a pulse. Okay, hypotension? Yeah, I would say so. We could consider sedation in a narrow complex. Uh, actually, wide QRS? Yes. Consider adenosine if regular and monomorphic. Okay, otherwise antiarrhythmic effusion. But really, this is an unstable patient. So I think we'll try adenosine, and then we're going to shock them. So let's go here. Give adenosine. Nothing happened. Uh, I'm going to charge. And you know what? We already got a bunch of amio. I'm going to give them some more amio. Now, you don't want to give them this push amio or this push epi. This is for dead people. And a quick hint, that will kill this patient. Here we go. Oh, all right. So we've returned to normal sinus rhythm but we have no detectable femoral pulse. So this is now PEA, as they would call it. And there's not much to do other than do CPR and give epis. So let's make it happen. We're going to give one of epi, and we're going to reassess. All right, well, now we got a pulse. We're back in wide complex tachycardia. So this patient is popping between PEA and VT with a pulse. So might as well start this amio infusion, charge, and shock this bad boy. Okay, now we're in VT without a pulse. Same thing. Let's perform CPR. Uh, I don't remember when our last epi was. We're at eight minutes. I think we've gotten three, so I'm going to hold off for now. I usually like to give epi every four minutes. All right, all right. Whoa, we've got normal sinus rhythm, and we have a pulse. This is ROSC, guys. We have ROSC. We brought her back. No, <laughs> and then she went right back into VT. Oh, no. Okay, well, I'm going to get her back one more time, guys. <gasps> oh, okay, okay, we're good. So there's a random chance of going to VT or normal sinus rhythm, and that chance increases or decreases based off of how well you're treating the patient. So when every time you make a new decision and reassess, the odds change. So we went into checking a pulse, and the odds changed to, hey, she flipped right back. Oh. <gasps> We did it. Map of 68. Norepi, dopamine. <laughs> this is not a good thing to give to sepsis patients. Phenylephrine and dobutamine. Vasopressin. She didn't need any of this dobutamine and, and phenylephrine. So the thing is, we beat her. She's at 68. We don't need to make any more changes. So here we are. What type of shock do you think this was? We already talked about low afterload. So we think this is distributive because we had low afterload and low preload. Click on this. And there we go. You managed to get your patient's map to 65 with 15 rounds of titrations. You figured out the correct shock type. You've unlocked this shock for the shock vault. I'll show you what that means in a second. Our stats here, we did 10 minutes of CPR. Three of epi were given. Three boluses of amiodarone and an infusion was started. No lido or procaine mine, and we shocked them four times. And then you'll get some information about what the shock was. Here's your treatment recommendations for sepsis. And you can even see the cutouts from the guidelines. What do you use? Well, norepi is a first-line vasopressor. We saw what happened when we added extra cardiac output to someone who already had high cardiac output. Didn't help. Caused VTAC. They suggest vasopressin second, which we did, or consider epinephrine. Dopamine is an alternative only in selected patients, AA, not this guy. So we did it. You can find out more about that stuff here. Here's a little fun thing of your amazing healthcare team who all took care of, uh, of this patient. And then you get a little prize. Recess Ranger. All right. Let's head back to the lobby. There's free coffee. Oh, there we go. So you're not only going to watch your patient saves, you're also going to check out how many you kill. You got your badge collection. Guess what? There's a badge for each and every room. And once you unlock the room, you can come in to the shock tank. The shock tank... Once you've done one of the shocks, you could choose one to replay it. Let's go distributive. We actually beat this one, right? We'll generate our simulation. Okay. You enter the room and see a young man who looks uncomfortable. They're complaining of severe abdominal pain and new onset fever times one day. Now, what's really fun is sometimes you can drive there afterload up so high that you cause them to lose a finger probably won't happen here but you could see all the changes going on here okay so 
as I'm increasing his afterload, his output is actually doing okay. And map is 66. So we managed this guy just with pressers because we saw his preload was okay. Hooray! And call that a distributive shock. And we're good. So maybe I'll make a little video of all of the other uh, shocks out here, but I think this is a lot of fun. You could play this game on your phone. You could play it uh, online. And there's some other resources to get you uh, up to speed on how to actually manage these shocks. Uh, resource, literature, and guidelines. So here's some extra resources you can look at. Landmark trials anything that you really want um it should all be here there's also a youtube video you can watch if you want to learn more about these shock states teaching you about shock and different shock states and the different changes that we're going to see in in all these shocks and help you understand which vasopressors you should choose it's a lot of fun i can't believe i got to do this this is really fun i might make a few more uh of playing these different shocks but this was a lot of fun, and uh, I highly encourage you to check this out. Watch the video to learn about shocks and then uh, and, and the different pressers, and then play the game to apply your skill set in actually managing shock. Find the game at thepoisonlab.com, medical games and resources. Just click play the game. Nurse sees you walk in. Let's look at four. Uh-oh, we got a trauma. So as you can see, there's many different shocks here, and I want you to have fun playing them, exploring what their potential uh, shock physiology is based off the history and their swan gons that you usually have in. And you can use these different things to figure out what to do. All right. Thanks for following along, and I really hope you find this as valuable as I have over the years. Uh, and if you could play this in VR, I highly recommend, because this is the coolest thing I've done in a long time. <laughs>